And I really, really appreciate uh, your welcoming uh, this program, Living in My Skin, which has been something quite important to me. I've been working on it for uh, well over a year with my good friends, Brandon Logan and uh, Seymour Battle. And I'm so glad to be here today. Uh, this whole thing started uh, right after George Floyd's death. Uh, and it just happened that that was about the time that all of us were being locked down in, uh, uh, from COVID. So we were all at home. We were watching. Uh, we were watching television. We didn't have much else to do. So we were locked in and saw that video of George Floyd actually dying right in front of us. And I think it affected every American, no matter uh, what our race was. We were all very disturbed by it. We were all very bothered by it. We didn't know exactly what to do. And uh, I uh, saw a post poster right around that time, maybe it might have been a week or two after his death, and the poster was in a little juice bar, and it said, you can't be anti-racist unless you are actively anti-racist. And uh, I thought about that, and I thought it made a lot of sense, and I said to myself, you know, I think I'm anti-racist, but I've never been actively anti-racist in my life. I've never done anything close, even close to that. I've never, I've never participated in any march. I've never uh, had any involvement at all. What could I do to prove uh, this message of this poster being true? And uh, at that time, that very morning, I was having a meeting with Brandon Logan and Seymour Battle. We were doing a real estate transaction uh, on Montana Street and Pine Street on the east side of San Antonio. My wife and I had a property there that we were selling. And uh, during the course of this business transaction, I asked both men uh, about how they felt, about what was going on. And uh, I assumed that uh, there wasn't much of a race problem in San Antonio. After all, uh, San Antonio is 65% uh, Latino. Uh, it's a city that has been uh, in racial harmony for many, many years. And even though the black population of San Antonio is only 7%, uh, we've already had a black woman mayor. Uh, we have the largest MLK march in the country. Uh, so I figured they were going to say, well, you know, it's not so bad here. It's different in San Antonio here. Uh, it, it's understood. It's not like New York or Atlanta or Los Angeles or some other big city. And uh, to my surprise, Brandon answered my question when I said, what's it like for you? He said, let me tell you about the daily challenge of living in my skin. That's the way he answered the question. The daily challenge of living in my skin. I was floored by that because he was so succinct in his answer and yet so compellingly accurate, I thought. And uh, so I said, Brandon, uh, Tell me about that. And he started telling me stories uh, about his childhood, about the everyday life of being a black business person here, about uh, having a nice car and yet being stopped in some neighborhoods because they thought that a black man should not be driving an expensive car in an expensive neighborhood, or being stopped while walking his dog because somebody reported a suspicious character. Uh, 
And Seymour had several stories as well. So I thought, my God, these stories, who, who do you tell these stories to? And they said, you know, as black men, we have these conversations a lot between ourselves, especially now that uh, the George Floyd video and the conversation about it is so relevant. And uh, so I said, you know, the only thing I do I'm doing right now <clears throat> is painting portraits. What if I were to paint your portrait, both of you guys' portrait, and maybe the portraits of, 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 other, <clears throat> of other folks, <clears throat> and we would mount a show, an art show uh, that, uh, that just featured Black men as San Antonio heroes. Uh, and they said, I think that'd be a great idea. Yeah, I think we can do it. And I said, well, where would we show it? Where would we, where would we go? What, how would we make it legitimate? Maybe we should associate with a museum. Maybe we should associate with corporations. Might a corporation sponsor this? And they said, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and uh, well, who should we interview? Who should we interview? Who should be, should we have, uh, uh, 10 portraits, should we have 20 portraits, should we have 30 portraits, how many portraits we sh should we have, just as many as you want to paint. Uh, and uh, how, uh, who chooses these, these men? Well, we can figure, uh, we can figure that out. Why don't we uh, try to have a very broad representation of, of people, of black men? Should it be women as well? I said, no, this is an issue about black men today, about how black men are dying and how much of this happens every day, except that somebody happened to videotape this particular one. Because somebody, that young, brave girl, videotaped that death, a modern day lynching, we were able to see what actually happened. And that brought a whole new uh, way of looking at this. Uh, where, and they both said, you know, it happens today as it's always happened and the, and the white cops always go, go free. And uh, we're left uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with this, terrible disgrace of this promise, false promise of equality in America. All men are created equal. That is a false promise today. It has been a false promise since that statement was made. And uh, all of a sudden I realized, you know, we can't capture this just in portraits. We have to capture their stories on video as well. So we started kind of making a list of who should be in it. And we said, well, let's make it a very broad spectrum from the very, very uh, uh, highest ranking person uh, in in statue uh, in stature in 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 uh, title uh, whatever it is to to somebody living under a bridge or a homeless person and let's make it uh, in all age ranges from ten years old to ninety years old and let's just have some people that are well known and some people that are not well known and. Uh, they gave me some names and then I started getting calls from people saying, I hear you're working on this. Uh, I, I heard you're working on this. Can I help? Uh, in fact, Sawana Balu was so helpful in this because she said, how can, how can I help you find somebody? I said, well, I need a, I need a religious person. I need a 10 year old boy. I need a 14 year old boy. I need a gay man. I need a broad. And she helped us find these people, 
course, Brian and Seymour, because they know so many people, they helped us find people as well. And uh, so they came in to my studio. I took their photographs. I started painting their portraits. And then I got a friend of mine uh, who has been my uh, assistant for the last 33 years, Janine Richards. Uh, she's Black. And she's been my assistant for 33 years. And I realized that I had never had a conversation with her in 33 years, specifically about race. We talked about business every day and uh, she helped me put together uh, all of the uh, elements that have to do with running a, a business uh, uh, through the years, but we never talked race. And I said, you know, Janine, it's amazing that we've never talked about race. He says, well, I know you've just never been interested enough to ask. And I realized she's right. You know, I've never been interested enough to ask a black person how they feel about how the world treats them. And I wondered how, and then I started asking my white friends and my Latino friends the same thing. And they all assume, well, San Antonio, <clears throat> we don't have a race problem here. I'm sure that black men here uh, don't feel, uh, don't, don't feel the way uh, black men in other cities do. But when, as I started, as I started videotaping these men, uh, I found that uh, some of them uh, uh, actually felt that they were being choked as they were watching this video, especially uh, one man, Mr. Simpson, who is, uh, in fact, the owner of that juice bar that I saw that poster at, uh, he said, as uh, I saw that video, I thought it was me calling for my mom. I felt the breath taking, being taken out of me. Uh, and he said, I could only watch it once and I've never been able to watch it again. Uh, and I asked the young kids about the same thing. I asked came up with a whole bunch of questions and I was interviewing these men and they just got, talked directly to me and we interviewed each one for about an hour or so. And we came up with a documentary and uh, uh, we asked KLRN Television if uh, they would be interested in showing it. And thanks uh, with the help of, of Seymour, who was on the board of KLRN, he was able to arrange that. So we got the time to show it. In fact, it's being shown again uh, in Black History Month at KLRN. Uh, and uh, I um, realized that this was stories that needed to be told, but I still had a big, big problem. I'm not Black. What right do I have to be telling this story? What right do I have? And Seymour and, and Brandon said, don't worry about that. In fact, it's better it's, it's not one of us telling the story because it's, if it's a, a Latino or a white person telling the story, it'll be much, it, it'll be more believable and more relevant, which I thought was interesting because I thought, you know, some people might be up in arms saying, this is a black story a black person should be telling and not you. And this is not none of your business. But as you would have it, the world just opened up we were able to get all of these people. We interviewed them. We were able, thanks again to Brandon and Seymour, uh, to uh, to be able to raise uh, over two hundred thousand dollars and uh, and enough money, in fact, to uh, be able to give scholarships to St. Philip's College. I think it was somewhere about forty five thousand dollars or so. And we're very very happy to do that because we actually wound up raising more money than we needed. Uh, but we were able to have uh, uh, the show go all over town. Well, the, the last uh, year uh, and a half, uh, it's been going up. Uh, you know, it, it's been at Bolero. It's been with United Way. It's been at the <clears throat> Frost Bank. It's been at schools, the Young Men's Leadership Academy, and on and on and on. The religious, uh, uh, the, the religious uh, community here has taken it on in, in a big, big way. And we've had about a dozen panels or so. So I would say that in the past year, 
it's been, a, it has raised the awareness of what it's like to be a black man in San Antonio. And hopefully uh, people like myself have learned, I know that I have learned so much from this. I had no idea how ignorant I was about race relations. And uh, I uh, think through this process, I got a PA, well, maybe I, I have a PhD in race relations, or maybe I'm still in kindergarten, I don't know. But I know that I'm a little bit smarter than I was uh, a year ago when I was working on this, and I've learned to be a much more sensitive person, hopefully. I've never experienced what these men have experienced. As a Latino, uh, some of us, uh, feel that we're discriminated against and 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 of course oh i have been discriminated against but never ever ever to the point where i have to be afraid of my life if a policeman pulls me over i've been pulled over many times for speeding and god knows what else having a, a taillight going away it was but i stopped the cop comes, I have no fear whatsoever. This guy's not gonna take me in. Uh, I, I pull out my driver's license and everything else like that. A young man today, if he is black, fears being pulled over by a cop. He knows the rules because daddies and mamas have told him, you make sure that everything is on the dashboard, your driver's license, your wallet, your, 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 your insurance, and your phone, and that you don't have to reach into your pockets, that you keep your hands on the steering wheel and you are polite to that policeman and you say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and answer all of the questions and be as polite as you can. I never got that conversation from my mom one day. I never had to. Uh, or uh, having been in a store and making sure that I've got my hands out of my pockets or that I have a receipt when I walk out the door. They never had to tell me that. Uh, they never had to tell me, if you see another per a white person coming towards you, go to the other side of the street so that they won't feel intimidated. But a black man, especially if he is big and muscular, and a white person is walking towards them, that white person will always hesitate. If it's a woman or even a man, they'll tend to walk to the other side of the street so they don't have to walk on the same path as that person. Or they will clutch their purse. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's uh, uh, Dr. Kelly tells a story about when he was first in, he's a gynecologist, a very, famous and one of the best gynecologists in the world, practicing right here in San Antonio. He had a white nurse when he first started uh, in practice. And uh, so women would come in, make an appointment. They would see a white nurse there. She'd welcome them. She'd go back. They'd open the door. They'd see him. And they'd say, uh, ooh, I, I, I forgot my, my purse. Let, let me go or I forgot something in my car, they'd get back in the car, they'd never come in again. And, uh, you know, that kind of thing has, has never happened to me. I have felt it, but I have felt talked down to. I have felt like somebody didn't think I was as smart as they were or as educated as they were or whatever, making assumptions based on the color of your skin. And I realized that I have made assumptions during my life based on the color of my skin. I'm 83 years old. Uh, when I was eight years old, <clears throat> our, my mom and dad moved into a neighborhood on the west side that happened to be right next to a black neighborhood uh, on Delgado Street in, uh, in the deep west side, which there's still a black community, a small enclave of a black community. And when my mother found out that there were blacks nearby, she said, we've got to move away. We moved too close to, to black people. Don't, don't play with them. 
don't play with them. No, why? Because they're black. So those were the messages that I grew up getting. I was here when blacks uh, were forced to uh, ride on the back of the bus. I experienced that. So you go into into a, a bus, you see the black people in the rear of the bus and the white people everywhere else. And well, that's the way it's supposed to be. You assume that things are supposed to be a certain way. And uh, even today, I still slip and make assumptions. Uh, a couple of months ago, I, I usually carry $5 bills in the car because, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, sometimes somebody stops and uh, you stop at a, at a stoplight and somebody's on the street corner asking for a few bucks, especially during COVID. It happened a whole lot more. And I was driving in a little, I have a, 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 a old 1979 Volkswagen bug convertible. Uh, that I've just restored. And I was driving with it with the top down one day on the east side. And a black man on the corner goes, uh, stops me. And I assumed because I was on the east side and this black man on the corner stopped me. I assumed that he was asking for money. All he wanted to do is congratulate me on that little car. So that is a fine looking car, man. I'm still making assumptions based on where I am and the color of a person's skin. So those assumptions that we make, even when we are not aware of them, are deep inside us. And we make those decisions. A friend of mine, uh, right after the Super Bowl, said, man, can you believe Latino? He's a Latino. And he said, there were too many blacks in the Super Bowl. They were just halftime show with too many blacks. I felt uncomfortable. I can't relate to them. I said, well, you can relate to all the players. Most of them are black. What's the difference, you know? But still actually make a statement like that says that we don't understand. We don't understand. I'm in the process of understanding. Uh, and it happens uh, a lot. And it, and it happens maybe once or a month or so where something that happens reminds me that I have a lot to learn. And uh, Maybe other people have a, something to learn, maybe not. But if, this, uh, if these stories open up one mind, open up one heart to understanding how much further we need to go and understanding that we do have uh, a problem with race, even in San Antonio, we feel that we will have been doing a, a, a very good job. I'm a full-time portrait painter, uh, and that's all I do these days. And I love painting portraits because every face is different, and every face is interesting. There isn't a face in the world out there that is not interesting or wants to tell you an interesting story. And capturing that... Um, mood with your, with the way the eyes are, with the expression of their mouth, with the way they weigh their hair or how they dress, or just what their uh, attitude is when that photograph is taken, uh, it is important and tells you much about them. I did a series of uh, Mexican women uh, mostly in Mexico. And these are street vendors. Almost in any city in Mexico, if you go on vacation and you go into the center of town, you'll find these ladies that are making little toys and stuff, and they're selling them. Uh, and uh, so you think of them as vendors. Oh, here, they, 
here's two bucks for this, whatever, whatever the, but when you look deep into their souls, they are artists first. They are business women. They are many, many times uh, single moms uh, and they are the breadwinner uh, and they're entrepreneurs. Uh, and if you capture that side of them, and sometimes it's hard to capture because they're so subservient that they, that they, that they won't even look at you. So you got, you, sometimes I'll say to them, okay, I'll give you $25. I don't need your dolls, but I would like to get, take your photograph. Uh, will you let me take your photograph? And I give them the equivalent of $25 in pesos. And they're amazed. But I'll sit with them for maybe 15 minutes and I'll get them. I want a proud pose from you. I want you to feel like the woman you are an entrepreneur, a businesswoman, a smart, intelligent artist. I want that proud look. I want you to give me a proud look like this. And sometimes it takes them a while. But when I get the look I want, then I'll take maybe 20, 30, 40 pictures until I get just the angle, just the light coming the right way. And when you ask what are the important elements, the first is getting that attitude correct, you know, getting who they are at the deep bottom of their souls. Because if they're not prepared for a picture or what you want from them, you won't get a good picture. You've got to paint a portrait from a good photograph. Uh, and then the next thing is have a good light source. Know where the light is coming from. I use a lot of color in my portraits and people ask me, where do you get that color? And I have found that you can use any color you want wherever you want to use it, as long as you get the values of light and dark. I can make the forehead blue, green, yellow, or pink on a black person if I have the light coming here and that pink or that yellow or that blue is light. And then where the shadows are, that doesn't matter if it's blue or orange or red or pink, as long as it's dark red, dark orange, or, or, or a deep, deep, deep pink. Because if you get the lights and darks correctly, you can have all, you, you can experiment with color all day and have a lot of fun. Or you can use very little color. Uh, I don't know if you can see, no I, no, I took it down. I had a portrait that I'm doing. Usually when you see a portrait of Frida Kahlo, uh, the artist that was married to Diego Rivera, you will see you know, flowers and a lot of color and everything like that. I found a picture of her when she was about 14 or 15 years old, where she's wearing a white shirt and, she, and a black coat, and there's no color. And so I said, oh, I'm going to do a, a, a painting of Frida Kahlo with... Uh, uh, with no color and, and see what, uh, what that looks like. So you can, ex experimenting is, is so important, getting a good quality photograph, having a good light source, and then getting that expression just right. Those are the key elements. Well, the portrait collection, I have donated it, my wife and I personally, to St. Philip's College. So it will live in St. Philip's College, hopefully for many, many years. But the, all the collection of all the th 33 paintings will be there with catalogs, with an explanation of what it is, and with a link to the documentaries. So you can really take in the full experience. Uh, so that will always be there and it will be only at St. Philip's College I would just really the, l l like to, to thank all the people that helped me, especially my wife, Kathy, that helps me uh, with, with, uh, with everything that I do. Uh, and uh, to Brandon Logan and to Seymour Battle and to Sawana uh, Ballou and to Janine Richards and all of the people who were involved in making of the 
of the documentary uh, and uh, and of course all of our sponsors.